All right, thank you. Um, so, yep, yeah, today I'll be talking to you about another type of challenge, the challenge of fire, particularly extreme fire. So, first off, I just want to start off with why are we doing this? Why are we researching? Why are we concerned? Well, New Zealand's wildfire occurrence and severity is tracking with the rest of the world. We're not as extreme yet, but we are trending at the same pace. Our maritime climate does give us some time. Now, all wildfires in New Zealand will be near something of value. We do not have the luxury of space that Australia and North America has. There will be no wilderness fires that burn for days and days without hitting something of value. We need to have different techniques to battle extreme fire. Now, using our maritime forgiveness to prepare, we have some time before we get to the point that we're seeing around the world, such as Portugal, Greece, and other Mediterranean countries, where the extreme fire is present in almost every single large fire. Now, what is extreme fire? Extreme fire isn't necessarily a big fire. It could be a small fire. What it is is rapidly spreading fire. It's fire that cannot be directly attacked to put out. It's the type of fire where you have to sit back, draw a perimeter line, and hope it doesn't cross. That's what extreme fire is. And we have a program. We're three years through it. It's a five-year program funded primarily by MBIE, as well as some co-funding from stakeholders. We have four main programs. And I don't understand why it does this. On my Mac, it says one, two, three, four. And whenever I put it up, it goes one, one. Anyway, um, so the first uh, program we have is to create a new fire spread model. And I'll be uh, showing you this um, later in the presentation. The second one is about decision support tools, so having some real-time decision support tools at hand. The third is um, the extreme fire prevention technology, and this is a space where we're playing with technology. We're playing with miniaturization, communications, data transfer, to really get an idea of what can we put out there that can help us, help us jump on that fire. So if we have a fire start, and we have some sort of technology that can slow that fire so it doesn't go to that extreme level, what tech exists? Is it robotics? Is it automated sprinklers? How do we make it cheap? How do we make it go everywhere? And then we have targeted protection. And targeted protection is about developing a method for protecting something of value. How do you create space protected such that if there is a fire, you can get on top of it. It won't go to that extreme level where you, you really just can't do anything. So just a quick touch on, this is a big program. We have lots of international collaborators from Australia, North America. Um, we also have some contributors coming in from South America that started last year. So large international program. Our timeline, in year one, it was really about making sure we set ourselves up right. We're going to do some pretty big things in the field. We're doing some pretty big things in the computational. So year one was designing it, bringing our international collaborators over. Year two was implementing the research. Now year three, the one we just finished, turned out to be about people. It was about transferring some of our results out, um, going out and sharing our results. Year four, that's the one we're entering, will be intense research. And year five, of course, is the finalization. Today's topics, what I want to talk to you about today, is our Nelson fire response and real-time tools. And that's about year three, about making sure our technology is fit for purpose and getting used. I also want to talk to you about a new fire spread theory that we're investigating. And then I do want to touch on global and local trends. So the, during the Nelson wildfire response, um, we had a science team member embedded into incident command. Um, she was an expert on fire spread and modeling for fire spread. And what you see on the right, that image there, yes, the right, um, is the what if scenario if there had been no suppression. So all that gray represents where the fire would have gone had there been no suppression. And that's sort of the type of modeling that she does. She also helped develop trigger points. So looking at the weather, the fuels, et cetera, do we let people back in? Do we evacuate? Are they temporarily evacuated? What's great about this is it's the ultimate collaboration. It's science working alongside by uh, FENS. We understand what FENS needs, and they understand what we're giving them and, and the uncertainty surrounding it. We also help them with the post-fire uh, behavior review. For the first time, uh, smoke was incorporated into incident command, and they were feeding that information to public health officials. So smoke's becoming a really big issue worldwide and locally, and in this case in particular, they were worried about shutting down the airport due to smoke or the tourist attractions such as um, the, the one of the big trails there over by Nelson. 
Um, we also use the model you can see on the lower image um, to look at the satellite information. So we're bringing in the satellite information, telling them where the satellites were seeing the hot spots, and drawing perimeters around that. This is uh, how we got to this point. So all this was happening automatically. That smoke tools was all happening in the background. It's running every single day. It ran today, it'll run tomorrow. Um, but this image you see here was uh, one of the fires in the Marlboro region in 2015. And all of that from the red, which is the Prometheus fire behavior spread prediction, to uh, the blue, which was the actual perimeter, to the flames, which was our satellite detect, to the smoke generated, which is the colored squares. All of that took a very long time to generate. And we said in 2015, this has to be automated. So our goal is to make sure we have this product for every single fire. So this is what's happening this season. We have two things running, two engines running, where we will run the smoke prediction, which we did last season. And for the first time, we'll also be doing automated fire prediction. So an incident um, command or rural fire authority, they see a fire started, they'll automatically get the what if scenario of a fire spread. They can instantly make a decision, they could associate it to their patch, decide it's real, decide it's not, pull in the resources. And this is the type of imagery they will get. They'll get information about the fire, they'll get the potential spread, and then they'll get the smoke. Now what's great about these real-time tools is we're building this massive engine behind the scene and we're coding it in such a way that it's quite flexible, it's modular, so we can bring in any sorts of data, add it in, pull it out, take new models in and push it out. And so what's great about this is we could take stuff that's been de being developed in Canada, United States and Australia, modify it for New Zealand and send it back out. Now, there's a real interesting thing going on in this program, and that is looking at how fires spread. Since 1940, we've worked with the same theory, and that is fire is spread through radiated heat transfer. So the fuel is heated to the point of combustion and the fire propagates forward. But we actually have a new theory, and we believe that this new theory is how fire is actually transferring. And that is the heat from the flames rises. And as the heat rises, it's drawing in air. And as it draws in air, it folds the flames. The flames actually touch the fuel. The fuel ignites, and that's what goes forward. And the reason why we have such hope for this theory is when we look at extreme fires around the world and, and the modelers who try to model it from the simple models to the really complex models, no one can model some of the stuff that's seen out there. There's something wrong with our models. This theory has high hope. Now I'm going to show you a video. When you see this video, I want you to guess which one will ignite first. Some of you have seen it. Don't cheat and tell your neighbor if you've seen it. Who guessed right? Anyone? Oh, some, yep. So what we see here is radiative heat transfer. In wildfire, the primary way fire is spread is through the fine fuels, the image that's all loose there. And what we see with radiated heat transfer into the fine fuels is there's a boundary layer of airflow constantly cooling them. So fire cannot be transferred, at least primarily, through radiative heating. Now, this all is coming out, this initial, from the Missoula Fire Lab in the United States. They have this great facility indoors. They have a fire table. And what's happened recently is they've been able to see new things in their lab, and this is over the last few years. What they've seen in their lab that was never seen before because they didn't have high-speed imaging, which we have now, especially in the infrared. And for the first time, we now have fuels that are 100% consistent. So the fuels are cardboard, they're laser cut. There's no variation in the fuel, so the only thing you see in the fire lab is due to fire. It's not due to difference in fuels. It's not due to difference in climate. It's only the fire. And as you watch this image, you could see those lobes of fire, and that's the air pressing in and coming up. And so this is what they've been showing in the lab, but we need to show this in the field. And that brings us to New Zealand and our program. So we did this massive field study. Um, we first started in the crop stubble. The crop stubble is most like that cardboard, cardboard fuel. You can see the number of burns that we did. Uh, we're highly instrumented. We had mm, many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars out there. I won't tell you how much, but we didn't destroy anything, so that was good. 
Um, it ranged from cameras to infrared cameras to thermocouples, which measures temperature. And that's what it looks like here, looking at the series of heat. So you could see the peak along that black line that's going along as the, the flames touch down and come up. We had lots of cameras. The image there you see is infrared, so we're looking for those pulses in there. We had lots of drones in the air. We had a Doppler LiDAR, which is looking at our big scale atmospheric effects, so we could parse that out from what we're seeing. We had a turbulence tower with our sonics. So in other words, we have, we're, we're looking at everything. We even measure the distance between the little wheat grasses so that we would understand what our fuel looked like. It was not fun. And we also measured our rate of spread of fire. So I guess the point of all this is we're out there, we're going out there again, we're gonna go in gorse, we're making it more complex. We really wanna see if this theory holds, but we, it's an expensive project, it's been a fun project, and we're hoping that by the time I talk to you next year, or the year after, we can say, yes, this is it. Now, I do always thank our firefighters who help us out on these studies. Before I close, I do want to touch on what's happening overseas, because as I said, New Zealand is trending um, with overseas. We're not quite there yet, so I don't want to scare you, but I do want to point out what's happening. So um, this was a last season here, so almost a year ago, um, North America had unprecedented fires. So in the age of fast communication, in the age of satellites, people cannot get out in time. So the question is why? Why, why is this happening? Well, what we do know now is there's a new fire regime, a fire regime that Australia, you know, that crazy fireplace, is used to have, but now North America has, and now Europe has. And that is the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface, is for sure gonna burn now. Before it was the, it might burn, we better start talking to people. Now it's almost guaranteed to burn in these places. But what we're seeing now is now the interface is actual urban centers. So my uncle from California, I talked to him about fire and he would say, oh, there's a mile of houses between me and that fire, it's not coming. And I tell him, actually, now it will be coming. It's a whole new regime out there, it's a scary regime. So what does that mean? Well, you look into North America, this was um, all the wildfires that were burning in British Columbia last season, and it was 2018, fires everywhere, so many fires they didn't even know what to do with themselves, smoke was all over the place, people couldn't escape the smoke, wherever they went, there was smoke. And what about us? Well, we do have our friends, the Australians, who send smoke quite a bit um, over to us. You could see it coming on that satellite image. We got calls from Queenstown, I think it was um, just before I left for the state, so it was late uh, August, early September. Why is it smoky here? We traced it all the way back to Australia. They were getting calls to the Rural Fire Authority. Um, Australia, if you notice what I circled, they've been battling already for a month. So I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying that the, we, as a fire community, we recognize this new trend. New Zealand is actually lucky. We have our maritime climate. We can start to prepare. And the challenge that we face is how do we prepare? How do we ready ourselves? We know it's coming. Let's ready ourselves. Let's put new technology out there. We don't have to follow what the big fire countries are doing. We can lead the way. With that, I'm going to show you a video. It has some sound. This is real time. We haven't sped it up. This is what it'd be like to see a fire coming at you. And it's pretty benign fire. So that's a 90 meter per minute fire. How fast can you run? Thank you.